Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is a coach at Camp Jansen. Today's guest is Nick Gloff. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. For sure, Nick. So I kind of like to uh, kickstart the podcast with all my guests uh, by asking them a couple uh, questions. The first one I like to ask everybody is, who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Favorite bodybuilders of all time. I'm going to say sitting in first. Eh, I don't know if I want to do it by number. I'll just go in no particular order. Has to not hurt anyone's feelings or get anybody, you know, riled up. Um, Dennis Wolf would be one of my absolute favorite physiques to have ever seen. He was one of the first people when I was coming into it that I had ever seen and was like, wow, what is that? <laughs> then uh, similarly, uh, Jay Cutler would be in there. And then as a third, as a third, I would have to say Luke Sando when, when we had him. Now, uh, I've done quite a few uh, podcasts with, with uh, you know, high level coaches and IFBB pros, and you're the first one, surprisingly, uh, that has brought up Dennis Wolf. Um, I had a chance, I went to the 2008 Mr. Olympia, got to see him pretty, pretty up close and um, I know he was kind of in the era of Jay Cutler, Ronnie, some, some really heavy hitters, but you're, you're spot on dude. Like Dennis Wolf's physique, like it was like, it was, it was beautiful, but it kind of had that freak factor too. What was it kind of specifically about his physique that you really appreciated Nick? It was really just the overall balance of everything. Just like you said, it was like he had the freak factor of just being a, a huge body and having development pretty pretty evenly and symmetrical across pretty much everything aside for his calves, which is the one thing that everyone always dug on. But really from top to bottom, he was very complete and he was just a huge, freaky, massive person. And so he had the, the pretty look that you'd see in some of the smaller guys that couldn't get to that mass freak factor type of size, but he also had the mass freak factor type of size. So it was like just a beautiful balance of both. That's really what I appreciated most about him. Excellent, man. I, I think too, like um, he had the height, right? He was, he's probably like what, six one, I think, or something like that. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. He's and a, and just, like with, just like with Arnold, like I, I personally have never been that big of a fan of Arnold's physique. I mean, you got to respect him because he's kind of like, you know, um, a, a pioneer and things like that in terms of bodybuilding, but just with Arnold alone, I think that height, whenever you have a very muscular individual that also has the height, it's always going to be usually generally speaking more impressive than a shorter guy that, that has the muscle. Right. So I think yep. exactly what, what we both kind of touched on plus the height, he had yep. that, that X frame. He had those really wide shoulders, broad shoulders, kind of like Jay color, but he had the height. And I think the height was kind of like that extra um, icing on the cake, so to speak, in terms of just that freak factor of, of Dennis Wolf. But I, that's awesome, man. I, like I said, I've done quite a few of these podcasts. You're the first one to bring them up and, and uh, definitely, definitely a very uh, impressive uh, physique. Um, the second question I kind of want to touch on here just to kind of start things off, Nick, is um, at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? I started lifting weights when I was about 12. So I started lifting weights as an extension of what I was doing for sport at the time. And so when I was that young, uh, really the first sport that I took very seriously was football. And in the process of me being able to play to begin with, because there was a weight limit, a weight cap on how, how big you could be to be able to play in the, the little leagues of football, I had quite a weight cut to make. And so I wasn't really into weight training at all or like really doing all that much aside from just playing outside with friends type thing up until that point. But then as a necessity of me having to cut the weight and get down, I had to start doing things outside of just the sport for me to be able to make it. And with that introduction, I had to do a lot, a lot of work to be able to make that cut. And part of that, just, just the intensity of what I had to do, it really, it, it kind of sparked something in me that I didn't know was there. 
that I really enjoyed just doing the hard work. And after that point, I found that I grew more and more into loving the hard work of like pushing myself rather than just the sports themselves that I was playing in. And so that was the spark and that's what set it off. And it was always just a, a personal love of mine for me to be able to go and dig and find another new way for me to push something else further. And so that's really where it started. Excellent, man. Now, um, I, I want to kind of just uh, take a step into your childhood, if you don't mind. Obviously, sure. that question, that, that uh, latter question kind of always leads us into the backstory, which is important because that's kind of like, you know, the, uh, the gist of the name behind the muscles. I kind of get uh, past just the sets and the reps and all the stuff that we see on social media that's kind of normal, quote unquote, for, for bodybuilders and physique athletes kind of get into the backstory. So if you don't mind sharing, Nick, um, where did you grow up? Just, you know, what, what state uh, we're at in the United States did you grow up? Um, obviously, you already touched on football. I'm assuming there was other sports that were a big part of your upbringing any siblings, just kind of paint that picture of your childhood a little bit up to high school and then kind of stop at high school and then we'll, we'll transition from there. Sure. So I grew up in a small town in Western New York called Fredonia. It's about, for anybody that knows uh, the Buffalo Bills, it's about an hour away from there, from where they're centered at. So that's the only way that anybody ever knows where Fredonia is. Unless, of course, they were from New York and went to college there. And so that's where I'm from. That's where I was born, raised all the way up through, all the way up until the end of high school. And then I moved a couple of hours away uh, into college, university at SUNY Brockport is where I went to school. And so peeling back childhood, uh, when I was a kid, kid. Really, I didn't do any sports that seriously. I did the same thing that most people did at you know young age. Parents kind of want you to dabble in everything. And so I did the, the baseball thing. I did some track. I did you know soccer, you know, the whole thing. And I did wrestling too. And wrestling is actually one that stuck with me. And so I started wrestling before I started football, but I didn't really ever take it that seriously. And so those were really the sports that were being played by that point. And then after When I was about 11, 10, 11, I ended up getting really sick. So I ended up getting appendicitis, which is fairly common, but it ended up putting me into the hospital for a good long time. And I had some complications with that. And so with that, when that did start on the day that it happened, I was outside playing with friends. And so in my young mind, when that happened and it just progressively got worse and worse over the day and finally capped itself off by me having to go to the hospital that night. The association was unconsciously implanted into my head that physical activity led to pain. And so there was a good year after that time where I did absolutely nothing. After the recovery and everything, it just, I sat around, did nothing with myself, just played video games and was a couch potato. And after that year, as you would expect, started gaining a lot of weight, was super inactive, wasn't doing any sports, just kind of got along with, with living the daily life that way up until the point where it got out of hand for me. It got out of hand. And even at that age, I was kind of figuring like, this isn't a good path for me to be going. It's not where I was happy. I didn't feel good in myself. Um, I wasn't really all that close with a ton of people. At that time, like a, a lot of like friends and everything like that. It wasn't, I had a couple of key friends at that point, but it was just kind of a social outcast and pretty much stayed that way for the majority of my growing years as an outcast later on by choice rather than by just the circumstance. But going through that, I actually had a, a good, a good friend of mine that became a good friend. That was just a guy that played on the football team that was in my class in fifth grade, all the way back. And he was just a super nice dude. His name was Eric. And he was one of the, the jock kids that would usually not, not talk to the, the dorky fat kid in class that just laid out his hand and was like, dude, you, you gotta come play. You gotta come play. I wanna see you do this. And eventually like pushed me enough. I was like, all right, fine. And so I did it. And then 
that leads into the first story of how I got into training anyway. So I started playing football, went out to practice, and I had about 20, 30 pounds to lose for me to make that weight cut off. And so I had to do that with some of the help of some of my friends that I had to make uh, through that, but mostly on my own to make it through with the guidance of some coaches that were willing to help me. And within that first year, I started to gain some sort of a, a leadership role within that because of what I was able to do with it and actually became a starting player by the end of it. Within the first year when I was pretty much doubted even by the coaches that I was even going to make it to be able to play on the field by the weight cutoff. So that was a start of almost like a hero's journey of my own, of being the underdog kid, having nowhere to go, nowhere to be. It was just not something that was in my wheelhouse and then bringing myself through just by pulling myself up, figuring it out and digging in and getting myself to do the things that I know was going to be hard and damn near impossible by the way that it looked making it happen. And then making an example out of myself for anybody else that was going to follow behind me. And even the people that were above and in front of me that didn't want to put in the work to be better started to pull in a little bit more respect from them and really become a leader in that right. And so that translated over little by little and the confidence that I gained from that continued forward into the rest of the things that I did from that point forward. And I was still wrestling at the time. And so I wrestled all the way through from when I was a kid, kid, all the way up to the end of high school. I didn't do it in college. And that was where my leadership role really took the most. So I ended up by the end of it being one of the, the leading heavyweights for the team as we were a, a fairly good team and known pretty well in the area. But the leadership changes over the coaching had been, had dropped off a little bit. And the generations that we had as the, the key players that led us into the state rankings were dropping away. So a little bit of the legacy was landing on just a, a handful of us to continue to carry on from being the people that were still there when that was going on and taking it further on ourselves. Brought up a lot of work ethic in people that really didn't know that they even wanted to be on the mat. And that's something that has always stuck with me as something that I figured out by just chance being, being placed in the position that I had to, to figure out how to be a leader where I wasn't naturally. That and as, as a kid, when I was around that age at about 12, my, my parents actually had a very nasty split up. And I have an older sister, and a younger brother. My younger brother at the time was too young to really understand anything that was going on. And my older sister is actually on the spectrum. And so she couldn't really put it all together either. And so I was at 12, the conduit between both parents to be the reasonable arbiter between the two of them for communications. And I was also having to act as a stand-in like parental figure for my older sister and younger brother. It had to be the voice of reason where pretty much nothing around me ever made any sense. So at a very young age, being just placed into the circumstances that I was and the things that I chose to be placed into and the things that I didn't led me into the direction that I have followed through up until this point where I had to set myself apart. I had to figure out my own way. and then while I'm figuring out my own way, try to be the, the voice of reason and be guide to the people that are willing to and want the help from me to be brought up there too. And so those types of values and those types of the lessons that I had to learn through all that process have guided me to where I am now. And I have a lot to, a lot of my history to thank for exactly how, how well I've been able to make it into the position I am today. I love that, man. That's, that's some, that's some, that's some, uh, real stuff, real talk right there. Now, um, let's, uh, what, what do you, what do you feel like, you know, going from kind of the, the, the kid that, uh, was at home playing video games, being inactive, you know, overweight and all that to, you know, it sounds like by the time you graduate from high school, you're in this leadership role, you, you've gained this confidence, you've got friends. Um, what, I mean, was that, did it just, did it just kind of happen? Cause like when you're younger, when we're at the age, things happen so fast, it's kind of hard to like, and I don't think most of us even really know how to like take a step back and, and, and reflect or anything. Right. 
Um, so I'm assuming things happen so fast, but now as an adult being able to look back, I mean, what, I mean, what, what was it, was it, was that a hard transition for you going from kind of the video game overweight kid to, you know, being in the, in the leadership role or did it happen so fast and just kind of unfolded that it, you just kind of stepped into it and went with it? Pretty much. I had to just step right into it. There was no, because of the, the timing of everything that happened in my life, then the choice of me to go and do that for myself happened at just about the same time that, that a whole lot of life circumstances had changed. And there were some other personal things that were happening alongside like the parents split up and everything. So other things that I won't really talk about here, but with all of the circumstances that had happened, it was just all at once. And so there was no opportunity for me to go and, you know, put on the hat, so to speak, and be the leader when I go out to the football field and then take it off and just be the kid again when I decided to. It was, this is just it now. You have these things you need to do. You need to be responsible for yourself. You need to show yourself that you could be a leader for your own right and then be able to guide everybody else with the calmness, being able to carry everything on your own shoulders and be the example for how to continue to walk while you have that pressure. And so there was no point that I could take that hat off. I had to continue to be that example. I had to show up in school and be the straight A student that I was, even though I had to struggle. I, I nearly failed first grade <laughs> because I was just not, not good at understanding math and just basic concepts. And I, I had always, even all the way through college, I'd always struggled with school, but I kept myself on a very, 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 very high standard for myself that I wasn't going to let that stop me. And so everything about my development kind of led in the same direction altogether that if you're going to do anything, speaking pretty much to myself, if you're going to do anything, you need to do everything and you need to do everything to such a good degree that nothing else can fall off. If any one part of any of the system starts to just drop, there's no way of picking it back up. There's going to be no leeway. There can't be any second guesses. It's this is the direction it goes and this is it. And because it was largely things that I couldn't control, with some things that I could control as far as choices to partake in that role anyway, it was a natural consequence of what I was going to do to then survive this and really make this happen was a non-choice. And then the things that were by extension, the things that I could have chosen to do or not to do, they kind of got all lumped in together in the same mentality that was getting built into me that this is just the way it is and you're going to do it. Excellent. And so, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I love it, dude. That's, that's some, um, some awesome stuff. It's some beautiful stuff because like, I guess the thing that's kind of coming to my mind, Nick, when I'm listening to you share your, your, um, your, your upbringing, your, your, your childhood, your early adolescence is, is life is the greatest teacher, right? And if we're open to it now, again, you're talking about a lot of circumstances and situations that you had no control over and all of that, but yet still life is kind of presenting you with, with, with opportunities to learn and, and you, you kind of took it and ran with it. And I think that's even now to this day as, you know, you being a, a coach and, you know, I own a gym and there's all these different responsibilities in adulthood if, if we're willing to take them on. But like, if we're open, like life is going to teach us so much. And if we're open to learning, man, we can, we can learn and learn and learn. And then that's where we can then in turn have an opportunity to come on a podcast like you and share your story, share your experiences, share your insights. And that's how we can really uh, positively impact other people. Right. So that's just kind of what's coming to my mind is like, man, like, even though you had no control over a lot of these uh, unfoldings in your early life, you still were, were able to learn, adapt, and now you're able to, to, to share that. So, so very powerful. Now, um, I, I know from just doing a little bit of uh, looking on your Instagram, just trying to study up a little bit before uh, we had our conversation, you have a, a bachelor's degree in exercise science, as well as a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in kinesiology. So why don't you touch on college? What was, what was that experience like? Did you go play sports there? Um, why don't you just unfold that a little bit? Sure. So yeah, I do have a double bachelor's exercise science and kinesiology. 
And while I was getting those degrees, I was also working in a biomechanics lab for a couple of years. And so I have a bit of a background in that as well. Um, but in college, uh, to knock off the sports thing to start with, I, I didn't do any sports in college. Uh, with the, the progression of the way that things went for me in sports throughout middle school, high school, by the end of it, I was only doing wrestling as my sport in high school. And I had by that point already realized that the training is what I love to do. And the wrestling was only enjoyable for me because of the fact that I was doing it with the people that I had grown through the sport with. And so going and continuing to do that in college, especially knowing where I was going to college, because the, the college of Brockport is known very well for wrestling and the coach there had been actually the coach for all three of my coaches from high school and all of my coaches were in their 60s. And so this guy that has been coaching at that college for all that time, he's very well known for being exactly the way he is. And so everyone that goes into wrestling at Brockport is owned by Brockport Wrestling. Every, every breath you take is monitored. And so that wasn't something that I wanted to do. Plus with my intention of doing the double bachelor's right from the beginning, I already knew that my time was going to be so limited and I had to pay my way through school and I had to cover my own costs because my family didn't have very much. And that's something I, I, star I started working when I was 12. So I had always worked and I still continued to have to for me to support myself. And so with working and then training being important and never letting that go, and then having some semblance of a personal life and then doing all the academic work and then taking on other responsibilities as it went, like taking on coaching is a thing that I started doing later on, not really is something that I did for money to start with. All of those things, it was going to completely disallow me from doing a sport. So I just cut it before I even showed up. Um, but college for me was a big learning experience and pretty much every way that it could have been possible to have one. So there was the first two years of college were really, really rough for me. It wasn't, it wasn't a place that I really fit in with a ton of people. I had my core group of friends that I was with all the time and I grew, grew through college with them. But even through, or like I said in the beginning of the whole podcast, I was a bit of a, an outsider as a kid and continued to be a bit of an outsider all the way through school through high school. And then I continued to be outside of that as well. For the entirety of really my whole, my whole history, I've been a bit of an outsider. And through a lot of it, it's been by my own choice. And a lot of it by just the fact that I am so involved, so involved in the things that I decide are important to me, that I don't fall out of the same wavelength as most of the people that I ended up finding myself around, where a lot of the things that were done, like I, my core friends in college, they were in the same major as me, doing a lot of the same classes at the same times and all that. But the amount of care that was placed into what was getting done for those classes and how much extracurricular learning was getting done was like, I had a podcast in my ears every single time I wasn't doing something. If I didn't have a podcast in my ears, I was reading a book. If I didn't have a book in my hands, I was doing the work I was supposed to be doing for classes. If it wasn't that, I was talking to somebody that knew more than me that could possibly like guide my thought process in the direction that was going to make me better at any of the things that I was trying to get better at at the time. And so with that kind of intent that I had on my every day of how I was going to treat every day as an opportunity to try and get some, another leg up, another step forward, I really didn't have very many people around me that thought in the same way. And so... It kind of left me as a tangential part of all the friend groups that I had ever been a part of, where I was always there and I always got along with everybody, but it was more so like, yeah, he's just going to do what he's going to do. And he'll come back to us when he's got the time to come back to us is the type of way that that always was. And so college for me was a lot of work and work and work and work and a lot of things that just like the main theme of pretty much everything I've done. It's been self-inflicted, self-imposed that I had to go as hard as I did just because I decided I was going to. And so I held everything that I did to a very high standard of work. And 
by the end of it, I got what I came there for. By the end of it, I had a lot of professors that either respected me or were very annoyed by me. <laughs> um, and I ended up coming out of it with a lot of a lot of lessons learned that I wouldn't have had if I didn't go. But I can say definitely that a lot of my uh, my education formally helped me to build a foundation and a structure, like the, just the base of what I used for me to build up on all the knowledge that I got outside of formal learning, which is really what I work off of more now, is a lot of extracurricular learning that didn't happen directly in the classroom or from a book that was given to me to read in college. Most of the things that I operate from at this point have been from sources directly in the special sectors that I wanted to learn from. And those things were things that I was learning all the way back then, which leads into exactly why some of the professors I had didn't like me so much. <laughs> little conflicting views at times, but that's, that's pretty much what college was for me. And during that time, I mean, this is a bodybuilding podcast. I had not competed all the way through that time. I didn't in high school. I didn't in college. I actually haven't yet. I'm 23 years old right now. I'm a year and a half removed from college and haven't made it to stage. And so that has been an in progress for all this time looking for really, I, I can blame myself quite a bit on it for the fact that I've been the guy that was like, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And push it off and push it off every year. And then I could say even to this day, I'm not ready yet, but I'm coming to be. Perfect. Now, um, I, I wanna ask you, you said you, you learned a lot of lessons in college. Can you narrow that down maybe to like, what you would say now where you're at, uh, a part of Camp Jansen and, and, and coaching and all that, um, helping and empowering other people, looking back on, on college, uh, what, what do you say is the biggest takeaway or that, that, that one lesson that just stands out when I ask this question, like, hey, this is something that I learned during those college years, whether it was you know, actually in class or outside of class, but during that time span, that man, I'm, I'm just thankful that I went to college and I had that experience, and I learned that lesson. What, what would be that one lesson, Nick? It would have nothing to do with the things that I learned out of a book. It would have to be that if you decide that you're going to do something, it's going to get really, really hard to do at some point. And there's going to be plenty enough things and plenty enough reasons that you can give yourself that are going to arise naturally on their own without you having to really explore them and find them. They're just going to show up like a sign straight in front of your face, and you're going to have to decide, am I walking through this or am I getting hit by the sign? And so through college, like the biggest thing that I had to deal with is the time strain, the time strain of juggling everything and keeping everything up to a high standard. It's very hard to do, especially with like I worked a night job, and so I was getting very little sleep, going to school very early in the morning and holding up on all my professional capacities as much as I could. At some point, after four years of being completely sleep deprived and working as hard as you can and doing all the work that you needed to, you get drained. You get drained. And then at no point does anyone give you a, a consolation and go, it's okay, you've worked hard. You can sit down now. It's no. It, okay, you've done this so far, so here's more. And it's always going to be like that, no matter, no matter what it is that you're choosing to do. If you're choosing to do something that is worthwhile, there's going to be the point in time where you need to turn it up. You need to turn it up and you need to be totally fine with the fact that you do, whether or not you resent the fact that you have to work even harder than you ever have doesn't matter because if you, if you made the choice to do it, you're going to have to do it. And you can take pride in the fact that you did afterwards. It may suck for the time being, but you'll make it to the end. Amen, man. The, the suck is always uh, worth it, right? Going through that suck. Um, so training wise, before we kind of get more into your coaching and, and the professional side of things, um, training wise, have you kind of, obviously when you're training in high school for sports and stuff, that's a little bit different, but I'm talking about kind of like when you got to train the way that you wanted to train, uh, was that kind of more focused on hypertrophy and you know, kind of more bodybuilding type stuff or what what did what what does your training look like for the most part when you got to choose how you wanted to train? 
I got to choose how I wanted to train since, since the jump, aside from the sports training. But that led me through a lot of different phases. And by the time that it was purely like I was in, like once I was in college and I was just doing everything for what I wanted to do for training, it was bodybuilding. I had decided earlier in high school, probably about freshman or sophomore year of high school, that bodybuilding was the thing. That was what I was going to do. And that is what I cared the most about. And that's what I geared all of my training towards once I got into a position that I could do that by itself. And that was just the thing I was going to be doing. Um, something about my training, though, that's a, probably a little bit different than most people that are just pure into bodybuilding from the get up is I have always included a lot of strength based work into what I do. And I've built up a foundation of strength and leaned into my ability to get strong pretty quickly, which is something that I just have. A, a genetic trait of mine, I'd have to say at this point, is that I can get strong pretty quickly. And I've always leaned into my ability to do so and leverage that as something that I can use as a tool to heighten my ability to do the hypertrophy work for bodybuilding. I've always found it fun to move big, heavy things, but moving big, heavy things to get you better at being able to move those big, heavy things for more reps in patterns that are going to be more conducive to hypertrophy is always just a base thing that I've always done. It's been an underlying current of all of my programming since the very jump. And up to this day, I still do. I still work on pushing on strength as an absolute value so that I can raise the standard of everything else that is done. And that has helped to, I would have to say, build more tissue on me than I would have done otherwise. So, um... You, you mentioned that you, you haven't up to this point competed because you don't feel like you're, you're ready. Right. Um, what, what is kind of the, um, mindset for you or the, the goal in terms of when you are going to compete? Like, is, do you feel like it's just, that's just something maybe that you've got to work through personally in terms of kind of like, I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not ready. Or is that like a, like a legit, like, okay, I'm just, um, kind of going, I'm trying to get to this point and then I'll compete. Like, what, what do you think that is? Does that make sense? That question? Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's been both at one time or another to begin with. It was definitely like just a personal, like insecurity type thing. So like, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not ready to do that yet. I have more work to do and I don't want to embarrass myself type thing at this point. It has a whole lot less to do about that. Cause I, I could care less about all that. I mean, honestly, someone's going to embarrass himself on stage. It's not going to be a big issue. If that's me, it's fine. Total. But for where I sit and with what I've been able to do with just dedicated to training over the last couple of years, I know that I can, I can do fairly well and I can put on a whole lot more tissue than I do have right now. And my goal at the end is to be a good open class bodybuilder, a pro open bodybuilder and be, you know, belong there. And so in my head, strategically, thinking more so about, do I want to spend half of the year of every year going through a competition cycle of going dieting for all that time, not really making any forward progress, and then having half of the year to make some progress, and then having to cut the growing phase short over and over and over again in my prime years for putting on tissue, where it's going to be the easiest for me to do? Is, is it really wise for me to decide that early on that I'm going to do repetitive cycles of doing a prep, or is it going to be better for me to dedicate as much possible time of these early years as possible to getting as much tissue as I can on my frame? And then once breaking into the competitions, I can start from a place that I don't have a really, really long way to go before I can actually do year after year of competing and still make the incremental gains that I would to be in an actual competitive standing. For where I am right now, I think I'm about at the place that I could, I could do that. Not to do a year after year after year competition is likely not, I'm not in the place that I could do that yet. I don't have nearly the amount of tissue that I would need to for that to be a really valid approach. But for where I am right now, I could definitely do something that is representative of the work that's been done up to this point. And it'll show me just about where it is that I stand. 
And up to this point, I've worked into my potential for what I can look like. And I have a representative physique at this point that I'm not as big as I'm, I'm going to be, but I can see what I look like now and have a good idea of more size comes on. What is that going to be like? Rather than a couple of years ago, rewinding it, looking at where I was then, I didn't have anything that was representative of what the possible endpoint could have been. And so going from this point forward, it'll be a no brainer. And if I do well, hopefully, obviously, if I do well, then make it into possibly going into national level. I would prefer to not have first season, ideally, get crushed. You know, just be, be good at a local show, be the guy, because everyone knows the guy that competes at a local show, has like four people in their class, wins it and thinks that they're going to crush it at nationals. They go there and they get absolute last. You know, they're just in the sea of people that get the same ranking. And then you just sit in the delusion of I'm a national qualified competitor. And it's just like that. That's all that you've ever done. Or being the guy that makes it to that point and has multiple years of work to do before actually standing on a national stage means anything. Never wanted to be that guy. And hopefully up to this point, since I took the time, I won't be that guy. And then if I do make it through in that first or second run, making it into high level nationals, if I were to get lucky enough to get a pro card at some point in the next couple of years, then I also don't wanna be the guy that got the pro card and then has another multiple years before being able to even be in be a household name of any kind in the pro ranks. Ideally, I would like it not to be a 12 year endeavor of going up to the top, falling back to the bottom, up to the top, falling back to the bottom. I'd rather it be sitting in a pretty, pretty good spot, moving into across the competitive planes up until the point where I actually find where I'm supposed to belong for the time being, and then put in the time to really breach into where I'm supposed to be at the end. The person that comes to mind when you're you're kind of sharing um, your philosophy on the philosophy on all this is Hunter Labrada, right? I mean, now you know. I'm assuming you probably don't have the gen the genetics of Hunter Labrada, but man, you want to talk about an individual that just is in it for the long haul and not the short haul, and seemingly has done it the right way because I mean, he's gotten the results, right? I mean, here he is. Um, this will be his second Olympia, I believe. Last year was his, his uh, Olympia debut. This is his second Olympia, and it's what, like his maybe fifth or sixth, seventh show, like ever, I think, something like that. I mean, it's, it's less than 10, I know that. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of what comes to mind. And, you know, I, I want to get into um, how you got connected with, with, with Matt and, and being a coach uh, un underneath him and uh, as a part of Camp Jansen. And, and that's something, Nick, that, that – um, I'm learning myself. I, I compete uh, as a drug-free athlete and stuff, but something that I see a lot with, with Matt and his approach with his athletes, um, uh, Brett Wilkin is somebody that comes to mind, is that it's, it's, it's about the long game, right? It's not about, you know, uh, seeing how fast we can get to point A and then point Z, but it's really like, hey, how can we have a legit game plan, just like you would see in other sports like football, basketball, how can we have a legit game plan and just stick that game plan so that when we do step on stage, like we, we, we make a splash, just like we saw with Brett. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of am learning just observing Matt and how he's, how he's approaching his athletes, how it's like, man, if you have that discipline not to compete all the time and, and really stick to the game plan, you can really in the, in the long run, have a, have a, have a really profound uh, impact on bodybuilding your own personal career and, and legacy. So um, with, with all of that, that's kind of in my mind, is that something that you've kind of learned uh, in terms of being around Matt and his own coaching philosophy? I would say more so we've meshed into like me being brought in more so because we were already on that wavelength rather than me coming in and having learned it after the fact from him. I've definitely seen those examples coming out of what he's done with his own, his own people. But 
being brought in was really because there was, there was a lot of commonalities that he saw in me and that he wanted to, to bring me in and then help, help me to do what I was doing better so that I could be a better coach primarily so I could help people more. And for me to be a better athlete in myself, using some of the principles that he learned over the years of learning and trial and error that he went through to expedite my process, the learning that the long haul, the long term is the most important thing to keep in the, the forefront of your mind was something that was already well ingrained in me for a very long time. So my thought process, as far as those goes, have been reflective of his for longer than I've known him for. So, so how did you, this fascinates me. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, 11 years older than you. Um, where, 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 where did that come to be? Because we, I mean, you're, you're, you're so young, man. I'm so young, but you're way younger than me. Um, and, and it's not too common that you see younger people grasp, uh, the concept of the long game as opposed to the short game, because we live in a short game world. Everything is Insta, right? So, so was it through some of your earlier life experiences that kind of taught you that, or where did that come to be? It was my earlier life experiences that brought me, brought me to that. Me having to deal with a lot of things over long periods of time, knowing that there was no, no end game to be had. It was how, how long can you sustain doing exactly what you need to do? And knowing that what you needed to do was exactly what you needed to do. So it didn't matter how long you had to do it for. It was what was going to happen anyway. Time will always pass. It's what you're doing with it that matters. And so I always approached everything that way after I had really had that lesson beat into me by just the life coming at me in every single which way. Just had to decide, all right, well, here we go. Step on out. Let's just do this and then go as long as the road goes before me. And that's always been the way that I've approached everything is the long haul matters a whole lot more than what you could do today, what you could do tomorrow. It's going to be what, what are you doing today and tomorrow that is leading you towards the end goal that we're ultimately trying to be. That's always been just the way that it's been for me ever since I can remember. Yes, man. I love it, dude. That's so good. So, so much wisdom from uh, a, a young uh, individual. Now let's, let's get into, so you graduate, you got your double major, you had all of your college experiences in the classroom, outside the classroom, did what you did, accomplish what you wanted to accomplish, and, 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 and I'm sure much more. Um, so, I mean, again, you're only 23, so you're, you're basically still fresh out of college. How did you have the opportunity to connect with Matt and become a part of his team? So, originally, actually, I don't know how it happened, but one of my stories that I posted up on Instagram so I had been posting like educational stuff since, since I had an Instagram really. And some of my friends in college told me and poked me enough. I was like, you, you just got to start like putting stuff up and just, just do it. Decided probably sophomore year ish that I was going to start doing that. I had done that all the way through and it was in second to last semester of school. I believe I put up a story actually talking about gripping mechanics for pressing and some way somehow Matt Jansen had seen that story I don't know if it just came up as something that crossed his feed somehow or somebody sent it to him don't know but he saw that and he actually replied to it and we talked about it a little bit and kind of asked me what really the importance was and got into the nitty-gritty and the details and through that first experience I think he, he kind of got it into his head. It was like, all right, there, I think I want to like poke into this guy a little bit more, see what's going on. And so over a couple of months there, he continued to do that. And when I put up something, you know, meaningful that he could relate to or something that he wanted to send off to his own people and have noticed, he would like repost and just try to explain what I was saying a little bit further. He did that, did that a couple of times. We had other conversations back and forth over things like that in that time. And then by March, uh, I was in my last semester of college. This was two years, two years ago now. And so I was in last semester of college and that's when the whole COVID thing happened. That's when it all sparked off. And so I was at that time going through all my last stuff, doing my internship and whatnot. 
and everything just collapsed all at once. It was the, the two weeks to flatten the curve thing. And so pretty much at that point, my last semester of school was done in a blank. And then at the same time, bodybuilding world changed dramatically in that time because our access to gyms was immediately cut off. Like coaching wasn't exactly what it was. And like things just, everything just took a major shift. And with that major shift, Jansen actually wanted to take an opportunity that he had at that time for him to reset the way he was, was looking at his, the way he did his work. And he doubled down and he spent the time to make him that much better at what he was doing. And with that, he wanted to start to build a little bit bigger of a legacy outside of himself. And so he wanted to bring into Team Camp Jansen a team of people that he knew that he could trust and that were representative of what he wanted to instill into his own people that could start to spread that and start to make it into their own. And so through just minorly like having conversations that went into like some personal directions, some, some less so into the professional realm, he thought at, at the time that everything had, had changed that, hey, of anybody that we could pull into this, then I guess, why not me? And so he offered me the job as being part of Team Cam Jansen and the rest is history. Okay, so uh, you're a very uh, smart individual and I'm sure you uh, were following Matt and you know, all of his uh, you know, athletes and things for, for, for a while before this, this, this opportunity presented itself. I mean, you know, you just being as real as you can be. I mean, uh, when he when he offered you to be a part of his team and 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 come in to kind of the coaching fold, I mean, dude, was that was that pretty surreal, or or do you just kind of take everything that life gives you because of your previous experiences, just because kind of the way you are? Do you just kind of take it, uh, shrug your shoulders, say, all right, here's an opportunity, I'm I'm going to go with it? Was it was it pretty surreal? Did you have to pinch yourself, or? You just kind of take it as it, as it comes. When I had that phone call, cause it was, it was a phone call. Cause he, he likes to do the professional stuff that way. For sure. The, the, the real conversation. Yeah. When the words were said that he wanted me to be on the team working under him. And actually that he wanted me to be a part of this bigger project altogether that that absolutely floored me i had no idea what to do with that other than just i mean the other part of me was like all right well here's the opportunity let's just do it i always have that in my head as well but the other side of it was like like wide-eyed like i don't even know what even this this is at all like this just insanity i didn't expect this to happen and me sitting on after the call after you after me being in you know this is business call get get through this decide everything talk us out and then after that phone call ended i was sitting there for a while like whoa that just happened and further on like as time went on because that, that's just like me struggling a little bit with my own personal identity of where i am and the fact that i had, was kind of semi-officially still in college and walking into that role immediately following it's like wow if anyone anyone would have told me a month ago two months ago three months ago that that would have happened i would have completely not believed it at all whatsoever and so in as it continued to go on and as i go on to like podcasts like this and things where i get reminded yeah kid from small town absolutely no one knows where it is in New York. And to the point, anytime I say I'm from New York, because I'm in Florida now here, two minutes away from Revive Gym. Anytime I say I'm from New York, they're like, oh, I, I have some family in the city. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm on, I'm on the opposite side, the side that no one talks about. <laughs> the part of New York that's disowned. <laughs> so coming from there, having a very modest upbringing, just the normal kind of like really not normal upbringing, but kind of run of the mill of like, you just do what you do. You just do what you do and went the normal route 
with a little bit of a twist on it because I was so adamant about what I was going to do with myself instead of kind of falling in the same pitfalls that everyone goes at like, what is the practical thing for me to do from here on? I was, I was never practical. I was like, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. So aside from that, being the little bit of the, the outlier of just, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and it's going to fall the way it falls. I never expected that that was going to be one of the cards that fell. And since then, every time I really think about the, the place that I am, like, this is ridiculous. I, you know what? You know what, though, Nick? Like, um, on some level, I can relate because, like, I'm from a town of less than five thousand people in Iowa, and that's that's actually I moved back here uh, around when COVID hit. I was living out in uh, Denver, moved back here, bought the gym that I I grew up uh, training at, and uh, you know the the gentleman that mentored me. He's since passed away, but I, I bought the gym and. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, so I can relate and, and, but that's something, I guess, you know, it's, it's been a struggle for me personally, being back in my hometown, you know, I've, I've lived in bigger cities. I'm, I, I just love the bigger city and stuff. It's been a struggle. It's been hard for me back in my hometown, but for the time that I'm here, that's something I'm really trying to be intentional about is like, Hey, you know what? Like you can be from a small town in Iowa, New York, California, Minnesota, North Dakota, you can be from a big city. It doesn't matter like your skin color, where you're from, who your parents were. Like we have an opportunity uh, to write our story. Right. And that's something I'm really trying to be intentional about is not to be kind of bummed out because I'm back in my hometown and I'm, I'm in the small town and everybody kind of has that small town mentality. I'm trying yeah. to be intentional about like, Hey, do what you know you're supposed to do during your time here back in your hometown with the opportunity of, of overseeing this gym to, to be that light, to be that encouragement to that, to that kid that's, that's in Cherokee, Iowa, your hometown, so, so that you can really encourage them like, hey, you don't have to just do the nine to five. You don't have to just do what everybody else is doing in the small town or have that small mindset or that small town mentality. Like you can do great things. You can have a huge impact, a positive impact on the people, you know, in the small town, in the big city, in the, in our country, in the world, right? Like it, none of that little stuff matters. Like it's all about what you want to do with your life. And, 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 and you, you're the author, we're the author, right? So your story, I can relate a little bit in terms of the small town. And it's like, man, like, but like, just, just, just do what you know you're supposed to do. And uh, something that came up when you were talking about that opportunity that Matt presented to you was like hard work creates opportunity, right? So you put in the work, and, and, and opportunity has come. Um, so now let's, let's talk about, I, I wanna be respectful of your time. So we'll, we'll wrap up here shortly, but I do wanna kind of get into the, some of the nuts and bolts of, of coaching, right? So now as, as you, um, ha you have the college education, right? You train like a bodybuilder, you haven't competed yet, you will eventually. Um, so, so what is your, uh, not, not necessarily mass, but what is your, coaching philosophy overall like when somebody comes to you whether they're a competitor or uh just like lifestyle what what is the process for you to connect with that individual and begin to work with them first thing is always first that the initial communications with what are done are always handled on a personal level i always keep the the professional tone to everything but at some point Everyone that you work with should be should become a friend is the way that I see it. I mean, there's always going to have to be a little bit of a separation. But the longer that you know people and the more that you can you spend the time knowing the people and working with them, you're involved pretty intimately in what their life is. I mean, just having to be a bodybuilding coach, you deal with, I mean, what are the reasons why you didn't get your sleep in? this night of the week. It's like, oh, well, I mean, me and the wife had this, this issue. It's like, all right, well, I mean, that's affecting your stress. It affected your digestion the next day. Your weight was up, the training, your values on your training, and the numbers started to drop on the training sheets that I track and all of your subjective measures of what was happening on that day, your mood, your energy, everything just took a dive. So what's going on? What, what can be done? What can change? And you have 
enough of those instances that happen where at, at some point it's not about really just the objective things that you change on the side of being a coach. It's not always right off the bat. Usually right off the beginning, you, you have to make sure that everything is just as tight as it needs to be. You're not trying to be the jokester or say, say anything out of color ever, especially in the beginning stages. You know anyone for long enough and be that intimately involved with their life, you're going to either end up in a position where you're great friends or you're just really, really, really not. And typically, if you're somebody that enjoys being around people that are like-minded, that are passionate about the same things, that have a very similar mindset, and as a coach, I mean, there's a million of us. There's so many coaches at this point. It's an exploded industry. People that are going to come to you are self-selecting. People choose a coach at this point pretty much based off of Instagram. They see what you're like. They see how you interact with other people. They see what your, what your typical thought process is like. And then they make their decision of whether or not they want to work with you based off of whether or not they resonate with what you do and what you say. And then it's obviously other content streams that come into, you, come into play there, but you get the gist. And so people that end up coming at this day and age to me for coaching are pretty well self-selected to be people that I, I get along with. They're people that kind of think in a similar way, that have a passion about the same exact thing. They approach the thing that we, that we do as a collective in a way that, you know, is really similar to me. And so obviously there's going to be things that I need to change and work with and make, make a better understanding, lay a better groundwork, shore up the places that are, that are weaknesses and start to build a thought process that's deeper than what was, what was there before they came to me. But it's not fighting against the resistance of having a, a total diametrically opposed ideology over what it is that we do. And so really all that I could say to it is that kind of a, a breaking down of the personal barrier into being that involved with people happens as a natural consequence of the way that we select the people that, are, that we are choosing to be around. And that would be kind of what you're choosing as a coach. And just over time, being in the involvement, it just brings you to that place. So um, what's the biggest lesson in your time uh, underneath Matt or working with Matt or however you kind of word that, want to word that, being a part of the Camp Jansen team? What's, what's the biggest lesson or takeaway from Matt personally uh, that, 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 that you have? Biggest thing that I've learned from Matt is that fairly similar, but with a twist to what I had always thought of as one of my principles is before being a part of it, is you, you're going to need to be conducting yourself in a way that is befitting of any of the hats you're going to wear at any one time. There's always got to be an undercurrent of what do you do? What standard do you do it to? Who are you expected to be? And are you proud or are you not proud of who that is? And if you have to change it, you have to change it. And that's something that I have definitely learned while being here around him and seeing all, all the work that he has to, has to do. I mean, people, people get to see a little bit more into his life nowadays than they, they would have used to. With the way that he puts out his content now, he's he is a family man. He is a good friend to the people that are friends of his. He is a, a businessman. He's a bodybuilder. He still loves to do it, even though he's not competing in it anymore. He's just a good dude. And so the undercurrent of everything is always ran with the work ethic, always, always needs to be up to par. And, and work ethic applies not just in what you're doing when you're sitting in front of your laptop doing your check-ins with your, with your clients or sitting in a meeting over Raw and Revive or Camp Jansen or whatever, whatever business venture it is, you're, you need to be up to standard with your work when you're trying to structure what you do with your family, how you take care of the people around you, how you treat people around you, regardless of how you're feeling about it. Talk to me about uh, culture because that's something uh, Matt Berzicott, uh, 
I had him on uh, my other podcast several months ago, and that's something at some point I think we kind of touched on. Um, and uh, I, I'm just, you know, I, I, I've bought in raw products. I've, I've, uh, I've got quite a few of the Revive products. I actually just got an order in today from Revive. Um, so I am very um, respectful and have a lot of just respect for the culture that is being built through, through all of you guys down there. Uh, through Raw, Revive, Camp Jansen, kind of all the all the the coaches, all the moving parts that that kind of uh, enco- encompasses what's going on down there in Florida. But talk about culture because that is something I know that Matt talks a lot about. I've heard him talk about a lot of a lot about that, like on podcasts, talking about Nick Saban and looking at you know these elite coaches, Phil Jackson, and how they built these cultures to be very successful in in football, basketball, what have you. For, for you, being a part of that culture, uh, Nick, first of all, talk about the culture. What is the culture? And then second of all, you kind of always kind of go into the beat of your own drum. For you personally, being now plugged into and a part of that culture, what has it done for you personally? So talk about the culture. What is it down there? Um, what maybe makes it different, special, unique? And then what has that culture done for you personally? The culture here has been since I showed up here is that everyone does what they do and everyone is given the space to do what they do at the best of their capacity. And if you're willing and vocal about the fact that you are doing that and you're here for purpose, then the people around you are going to support. Whether that support is through just Revive and Raw is like they, they supply supplements to their athletes that are here. Um, they do give the support by promotion. And more so than that, than the stuff that you see and you could write onto a contract, it's just being around in the same space and knowing that everyone is there for moving everything forward. The culture itself is encapsulated in everyone is pulling to get this culture dragged forward and to make it expand across more levels than just what is the gym floor of Revive Gym here and the people that set foot here. It's about bringing that energy and bringing everyone that does, I mean, even, even to this day right now, with all the people that we have in Revive Gym that are doing their thing, even still, they all do, just like I do, come and dance to the beat of their own drum. Everyone comes and does their own thing. Not everyone comes in here as a lot of really famous like meccas of bodybuilding have been. Like everyone goes there and they come become a part of a team And that team does everything together. It's not really exactly how it works here. We have functions where everyone is together and we share in the same cause. So there's, there is always the circling back to being the team, but everyone on the team has a mutual understanding and respect for what you're doing is what you're doing. What I'm doing is what I'm doing. If we have something that we're going to collaborate on because it makes sense to do it, then we're going to, if we're not, It's not a problem that you do your own thing. Everyone has their own thing. And we're trying to all be the best at what we do because being, being a team and being a culture, if everyone has to be a part of the click, so to speak, then it's not an inclusive environment to anyone outside of that as, as of that point for them to come in and feel welcomed by the fact that they're a part of the culture too. If the culture is based off of the fact that you're the in-group then there's not a lot of inclusivity to the people that want to be a part of it that aren't yet. It's about putting out that culture to the point that you know everyone's here for this. This is the work. Doesn't matter where exactly it is you're pointing your work towards as the goal. We're here for the work. Everyone mutually respects the work. If you're here for the work, you're welcome. And that has, I, I think that's pretty much what the gist has, has become from anybody that's not here. When seeing the YouTube videos that come out of here with all the people that train here, uh, Ian and Chris, and then Jansen and Walker and Berzakot and really everyone else that has come through here, even Brett was here not too long ago. Everyone that does make it through this place, you come in and that, that's what it is. Coming here, you're going to shake hands, you're going to say hi, you're going to get down to work. And when you're not here, you can still feel like you're a part of it because it's, it's all a part of just 
the general undercurrent of what everyone else is doing that finds themselves under under the banner and finds themselves rep representing it, whether or not they're official part of it. It's about pulling bodybuilding together. So what is that being a part of that culture done for you personally then? For me, as a perennial outsider with everything that I have ever done, me being that person for a very, very long time, it made me feel spiteful of the fact that I was the outsider, even when I had maybe active participation to try and not be. But just the way that I was and the way that I approached my daily life was just not something that resonated with most people. And so it wasn't, it just wasn't what, it, what I belonged in. And then be coming into a culture here that is about the fact that we're all doing our own thing. We're all expected to do our own thing and own it and be good at the fact that we do it and we do it for our own sake to the benefit of others if that's the way that it goes. But primarily it's for ourselves to be doing the thing that makes us most fulfilled. And by extension, it will extend to other people. Being that that is the culture that I've walked into here, it's better empowered me to think more independently about what I'm doing and not feel like because I've been brought in and this is where I am that I have to conform into what it is that I believe the culture to be just by looking at it from the outset. I don't have to try and fit myself into the puzzle that I imagine that this is. I'm just here as another piece of the whole thing that just falls into the place that I do because of the fact that I am who I am and I do what I do. Then everyone else that is just the same, they're their own specific puzzle piece in the whole jigsaw. They fall into place where they fall into place because of the things that they do and the fact that they take pride in it too. And so it's, it's been, that's exactly what it's been for me. Super cool, man. All right, we're going to finish up here. I, I want to ask you, um, in terms of personal growth, right, uh, Nick, what there, there's obviously a lot going on in your life, a lot of amazing opportunities, and there's going to continue to be because I know you're going to continue to put in the work. But is there anything kind of like um, when you're when you're not working with clients, when you're not you know training, when you're not kind of involved in all the health and fitness and all that? Is there is there an area um, in your life that you are really um, trying to focus on or be intentional to improve in or or grow in? I think the biggest deficit that I have always had is interpersonal relationships is really where, I mean, aside from just basic bodybuilding and being a coach and having a relationships through that and the ones built on the foundation of bodybuilding itself, it's the relationships that I have with people that are, that are close to me that don't necessarily have that same tie that have, have been difficult on me to try and maintain and do the due, due diligence and justice for it. And so those things are I mean, honest, honestly very personal to me, but being exactly as honest as I think I should be, those are things that I definitely needed to work on and things that I continue to need to work on. And something that I do work on is my ability to connect with the people that I don't have all the same passionate commonalities with. It's more about the fact that I appreciate those people as human beings. And even though there's not going to be that same foundation of understanding based off of what it is that we take our passion in, there's commonality between everybody. And being able to get past just the, the things that I inundate myself with as the things that I've chosen to be in the things that I've chosen to take a part of, finding myself in in personal situations that I need to handle with more tact and be better with is just the people that I have close to me that, that don't resonate like that. And that is definitely where I put the most effort. So um, last question here, in regards to um, your, your, your coaching and what some maybe ideas or thoughts that you have for long-term I, I'm not going to ask you where you see yourself in five years or 10 years. Cause I always hate it when people ask me that. It's like, dude, I, I can barely yeah. see past 
right now, right? Like who knows yeah. what's going to happen tomorrow. So that's not what I'm kind of, I, I want to get at, but in order to be uh, somebody who's, you know, wanting to be the best version of themselves and, and pursue that excellence, there's got to be some sort of looking ahead, right? There's got to be some sort of vision. There's got to be a, a direction that we're taking. So what is kind of that direction you're taking? What is maybe that, that hopeful, um, you know, end game or future hold for you in terms of coaching, in terms of career, in terms of just kind of like what you are building towards? The biggest thing that I'm building towards is my, my major passion, aside from the body, the training, really, because obviously if competing was my major passion, I would have done it seven times by now. My major passion is the training. Secondary to that is education. And through my experiences of going through my own personal education, me learning, the more fulfilling part of me learning has been going and teaching other people. And more recently, I've started doing like seminars, things where I'm, I'm doing presentations and having the opportunity to, to hand off some of the things that I have learned and that I can demonstrate within myself as things that the things that I have mastered. I try not to breach myself into any sort of direction that I can't claim as something I, I can do myself before I start teaching on it. But the things that I know that I can own and the things that I have gone and done the due diligence to learn and then apply and take it to the very ends of where, where I can take it to. And I've learned all the lessons that you can't learn from just sitting down and reading it or watching somebody's YouTube video about it. I have gone and made it an effort for me to be able to make those connections with people across that boundary to have them get the light bulb moment that I had to learn on my own. And in the next couple of years, that's really one of the, the, the two things that I really want to be able to take the furthest possible are going to be my training. And then as an extension, my training and then just the lifestyle of bodybuilding leading me into the competitive realm that I see myself being able to get to, hopefully. If not, then just training like an animal just by the fact of it is going to be what I'm really looking forward to. Um, but then second to that is going to be being a, a respected educator in the space and being able to give all the information that I have, have learned and taken the, the time to in all the ways that I have up to, the, up to that point. And so I can help the people that are, you know, people like me or people that aren't like me that do or do not have the ability to go through those experiences on their own to learn all the things that I did and that I will to lead people forward into just another stratosphere of what bodybuilding on the base level can become and try to start leaving a legacy where me and there's a handful of other people that are working, working hard to try and make this, this the reality of bringing up the standard of bodybuilding so that everyone walking in has the resources to be able to sift through, to have the basic understanding that we're all on a similar page and that we're not relearning the same lessons the, uh, over and over and over again over decades, which is up to this point, a lot of what we've been doing is the, the cyclical nature of how the pendulum swings in what we do and how we do it within this realm. We're now in a place that we have the resources, we have the people, we have people that have experienced it all, we, that have gone and done more book learning than probably anyone in bodybuilding up to this point have done. It's a new era in trying to lead the new era of bodybuilding as people are growing through it into a place that we're actually in a better spot than we ever have been in the past. We can get people through the career safer. We can get them to train harder, but smarter, have them accurately apply themselves, know where their place is, where their place isn't, what to apply, what not to apply, what to try and what's a bad idea. So as a collective, as everyone that participates in this thing has a direction to move and we're not sitting on the same base level that we have for so long. That is really, as you can tell, as I've gone long-winded on that, that answer, that's really the thing that I look forward to most and the thing that I'm trying to get to the most. To try and drag everyone, even kicking and screaming, to a place that we're all at a common understanding of the fact that we can all do this better and then do it better. Excellent, man. So uh, 
definitely, definitely um, a, a lot of just insight that you shared, uh, Nick. So I, I just want to thank you for taking some time out of your schedule. You said this is the second podcast you've done today. So I appreciate you uh, jumping on here to, uh, to, to podcast with me on Behind the Muscle. Um, if there's anything that you kind of, we, we definitely, uh, and this is what I love about this podcast specifically is we don't, again, we don't always necessarily get into the nuts and bolts of the sets and the reps because there's, there's all kinds of podcasts. There's all kinds of, you know, social media platforms talking about that stuff. I love kind of getting behind the muscle, behind the curtain, um, and, and we definitely did today. So, so thank you for just the transparency and kind of opening up, keeping it real. Um, so we've had a lot of thorough conversation. If there's anything that you kind of want to leave the listeners with at this time, please feel free to share that. And then also where can people connect with you? Where can people reach out to you? Where can people follow along? Just kind of uh, share your social medias, any, uh, any sponsors, any discounts, anything like that. Um, after your final thoughts, go ahead, share that. And then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll close this out. So final thoughts would be that to close out on me personally, that there's always going to be something that needs to be tackled. There's always going to be something in your way. There's always going to be a new opportunity waiting on the other end of it. Don't get defeated. It's way too easy to sit down on what you've already done and decide that you've worked hard enough to, to take your rest and that rest ends up being the end of any ambitions that you end up having because the momentum of having to get yourself, yourself started again is much, much harder to build than you continuing on forward in working and reinforcing yourself into being the person that you need to be to continue to be successful and successful at a high level. So I guess as a final thought coming from me would be a message to myself and a message to anyone that is in a, I mean, Honestly, anyone that's 23 or, or below, <laughs> and probably a, a lot of people are in and around that, that age group or even, even higher into their 30s, we're all here doing the same thing. And the same thing doesn't necessarily need to mean training. It's We're doing everything to a standard. And if you're not doing everything to a standard, then there's something to be changed. Where can people connect with you at, uh, Nick? My main spot to find anything for me is on Instagram. So my Instagram is just my name, Nick Gloff, N-I-C-K-G-L-O-F-F. -F. No extra fancy stuff in there, just me. Um, you can find pretty much anything of how to contact me through there. Uh, you can send me DMs if you want to talk to me. Um, I answer all of them, even if it takes a little bit of a lag time to get to all of them. Um, aside from that, Obviously, everybody go check out uh, Camp Jansen. Check out the Camp Jansen YouTube. Check out the app. Check out everything that we're doing here. Follow Matt. Follow Matt Berzakot. Follow Walker. Follow Justin Jacoby. Everyone that's involved. Revive. Revive MD. Get Raw Nutrition. Uh, sponsored uh, with code GLOF. Just GLOF. That's it. And then um, sponsored also by Strength Unit. Uh, uh, a clothing brand of one of my friends that is very near and dear to me. So that's just Gloff 15 if you wanted to get some of their gear. It's good stuff. And then last one would be myself and Luke Miller of No Switch Fitness and John Jewett of J3U are going to be giving a seminar in San Antonio on October 24th. So anyone that's interested in safe use models for PEDs, monitoring blood work, and then optimizing training for longevity and hypertrophy goals. Interested in any of those? Get your tickets, get out there. Link for that is in my bio as it is in Luke's and John's. And that's just about it. Very cool. Nick, thank you so much, man, for taking some time. Like I already said, again, a lot of insight dropped. Um, for all you listeners out there, I, I highly suggest you go uh, follow Nick and just plug into what he's sharing. Super young guy, but obviously, as you guys can tell, very well spoken, very experienced for how young he is. Um, Nick, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. So, listeners, uh, two things I just want to ask of you here quickly if you have not done so already, go to Behind the Muscle Podcast YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. Um, I am uh, just busting my butt, putting in the work to get 
you guys as many uh, top-notch uh, coaches, um, IFBB pros on the podcast, just them sharing their stories, getting content out there. So um, you can follow all of that um, and uh, just uh, stay on top of uh, everything that's being put out there in terms of behind the muscle podcast on YouTube. And then second favor I would ask of all you guys, as I know you found a lot of great value in Nick's episode specifically, take this episode, share it please on all your social media platforms, especially Instagram. Uh, Make sure you tag Nick. Uh, tag behind the muscle so that we know that people are listening, that people are gaining value. Um, Make sure you guys, uh, again, follow Nick, hit him up, reach out to him, connect with him. And finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember, behind the muscle, there's always a story. Until next time, I'll catch you guys later.